Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon and good evening. Thank you for being here, and I'm very grateful to the Union for the very kind invitation. My submission for your consideration uh, could be put in the form of a resolution. Resolved that Donald J. Trump should not be impeached. Let me elaborate. For the United States of America, impeachment continues to be a lively source of debate. Not so here in the mother country. You've moved beyond that. It's still part of your unwritten constitution. However, it has fallen into a state of desuetude. I'm going to suggest that we should follow the British example. But let me focus this evening and then in the conversation, I hope to expand on that proposition. Let me address specifically the issue of the proposed impeachment of President Trump. I want to begin with a stipulation. To his enemies, and there are many of them, the president should be politically resisted at every level, at the political level and the policy level. To his critics, and they are likewise many, his style, embodied in his fondness for Twitter, is at best undignified and at worst embarrassing. More generally, many observers decry the president's character and frequently describe it in quite harsh terms. I don't need to elaborate. But my submission, however, is that these various and sundry criticisms are beside the point with respect to the foundational issue of impeachment. This cluster of attacks, even taken all together, boil down to a deep dislike distrust, and at bottom it calls for action at the polls for those who feel this way. But the question pending before the United States House of Representatives is quite distinct. Should the American people, through their elected representatives, overturn the results of the very bitter, hard-fought 2016 presidential election? My suggested answer to this distinguished house is emphatically no. To some, and I recognize this, impeachment represents a solemn duty. The following uh, is heard. This is not about politics. This is about the president's crimes, and in particular his obstruction of the investigation of Robert Mueller III. Let me be clear, I'm stating the allegation. My response to this is threefold. First, the text of the written Constitution suggests that the grounds for impeachment should be extraordinarily weighty and compellingly persuasive to virtually all persons of goodwill, regardless of their politics. After all, the relevant clauses in the written Constitution summon the People's House, the House of Representatives, to assess whether the President of the United States is guilty of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. The report issued by Special Counsel Robert Mueller III reluctantly, and I would say grudgingly, absolves the president of the crime of conspiracy or collusion, conspiracy specifically with Russian interests during the 2016 presidential campaign. I've made a study of the report, and in my view, the conclusion of the report of no collusion, it's insufficient evidence to establish collusion, is spot on. I want to cite one example from the Mueller report 
itself. Consider the fact that in the wake of President Trump's very surprising victory in November of 2016, Vladimir Putin gathered his trusted oligarchs in the Kremlin to brainstorm. They were to brainstorm about how to establish relationships with the incoming administration. These again are not my words. These are the words of the Bob Mueller report. How do we establish relationships with the president-elect himself? But stepping back, the whole suggestion of collusion of the president's campaign with Russian interests seems rather odd. Indeed, in the wake of the Mueller report, one sage observer on our side of the Atlantic put it this way, it seems unlikely if not outright preposterous, that the Russians would have entrusted a sensitive intelligence operation to the most shambolic general election campaign in modern memory. The campaign was indeed a shambles. It succeeded nonetheless. Did the Russians interfere with the presidential election? Manifestly and indisputably so. This too is documented in the Mueller report. The interference came primarily through social media. Indeed, <coughs> one should read not only the Mueller report if one is interested, but the two very elaborate, we call them speaking indictments, returned by the Mueller grand jury, chronicling the activity of two Russian organizations and 11 Russian individuals. This speaking indictment, both of them, including then a second indictment with respect to Russian governmental officials who have been charged with hacking various uh, accounts, are quite elaborate, not a word in the indictments, which are over a year old, with respect to possible collusion or conspiracy. In short, notwithstanding the proposed Trump Tower project in Moscow and the testimony of the president's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, the Kremlin, according to the Mueller report itself, was caught flat-footed. Everyone expected the former Secretary of State to win, and to win rather handily. I want this to be a point of emphasis. The Kremlin, by the Mueller report's own words, did not have contacts or connections with either Trump Tower, the transition team, or the president-elect himself. Nor is there any suggestion in the Mueller report, or indeed elsewhere, that the president somehow succumbed to acts of treason or acts of bribery, the enumerated offenses in the Constitution. There is no suggestion in the Mueller report that the president-elect or the president's campaigner somehow betrayed his or her country or was somehow seeking to overthrow the government. So that leaves only what the Democrats in the House Judiciary Committee are principally complaining about. Obstruction. Obstruction of the Mueller investigation itself. And that brings me to the second point. The claim of obstruction of justice is the claim or contention that a federal crime was committed. It's not obstruction in some moral sense, it's obstruction in terms of the elements of a federal offense. My suggestion to the House. First and foremost, Bob Mueller himself did not conclude that the President had actually committed a crime. Rather, the Mueller report refers to, quote, obstructive acts, such as the first enumerated acts was the firing of the FBI director, James Comey. That analysis, in my judgment, but it's only my judgment, 
is extraordinarily weak even with respect to the soft category of an obstructive act. The fundamental reason is this. To be sure, the president huffed and puffed. He tweeted endlessly. He cried witch hunt at every turn. But this is, to me, of fundamental importance. He allowed the investigation to continue and for the probe to be quite generously staffed. In contrast to President Richard Nixon of a generation ago, who fired the special prosecutor, we would now say special counsel, and indeed cordoned off the offices as a crime scene, not only did the president not fire Mr. Mueller, he hoped to, threatened to, but didn't, he permitted his own White House counsel and other senior staff to cooperate with the investigation. Indeed, to my surprise, the White House counsel testified or was interviewed for approximately 30 hours with not a single invocation of a constitutionally ground privilege recognized unanimously by the Supreme Court called executive privilege. Nor did he invoke attorney-client privilege, which was likewise presumably applicable to many, if not all, of the conversations between the White House counsel and the president. In addition, as an historical matter, even if President Trump had been guilty of the crime of obstruction, which I don't think he was, that very offense has not passed muster in the recent past as justification for removing a duly elected president from office. The case 20 years ago of President Clinton's impeachment, which, with which I'm passingly familiar, is quite instructive. President Clinton was clearly guilty of perjury, including willfully lying before a duly constituted federal grand jury but more relevant to our discussion this evening. He was also guilty of obstruction of justice. Indeed, he was found in contempt of court for obstruction of justice by the Chief Judge of the United States District Court. But obstruction of justice as a crime, even combined with demonstrated perjury, a felony, was not deemed of sufficient moment to remove the president from office. Rather, the following view prevailed 20 years ago. Let the president serve out his term, and then let him face any consequences of his criminality once he leaves office. And sure enough, President Clinton on the very eve of his departure from the White House, entered into an agreement with the special counsel, called Independent Counsel, Robert Ray, a career prosecutor, acknowledging his guilt, agreeing to pay a monetary fine, and acceding to the loss of his law license for an extended period. Why? To avoid criminal indictment that would flow in the year 2001, or predictably could flow. Third, and finally, a prudential reason grounded in American history argues against impeachment. And once again, the Clinton impeachment saga provides invaluable insight. Although during the Clinton impeachment, 31 Democrats in the House of Representatives supported one or more articles of impeachment, it was well understood at the time that the Democrats in the United States Senate, where the trial would take place and did take place, although in the minority then as now, were firmly tethered to the president politically and constitutionally. Many of the Democrats in the Senate sought a middle ground, such as a resolution of censure 
proposed by, among other persons, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein from California, who is still serving the people of California, urging a resolution of censure, thoughtful senators such as Senator Feinstein and Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut encouraged the Senate not to accept the impeachment articles from the House of Representatives, but to find another way. Today, as of our gathering in this historic hall this evening, not a single Republican senator is prepared to vote in favor of impeachment, namely of removing the president. Not one. Indeed, as of the time of his testimony last week before the House Judiciary Committee, John Dean, who during the Nixon White House was the mastermind and admitted and pled guilty to a felony that he had been the mastermind of the conspiracy to obstruct justice in the Nixon White House. Even then, a majority of House Democrats, not on the Judiciary Committee, but in the House of Representatives, stood quietly opposed to impeachment. Why? It is certainly not out of fondness for the President of the United States on the part of the Democrats. But there's a revulsion against the national divisiveness destined to come with impeachment which may be one of the reasons that this country has essentially allowed impeachment to die a quiet death. Now, could that sentiment change on our side of the Atlantic? Of course. If new facts emerge demonstrating beyond reasonable debate that the president had committed serious crimes constituting an abuse of power, but as it presently stands, there's no basis, in fact, for such a prediction. After all, Robert Mueller III's very extensive, very elaborate, 674-day investigation was thorough and comprehensive. It was comprised of a tightly knit cohort of full-time prosecutors and who were working without restriction with the aid of, count them, 40 FBI agents. That's an extraordinary allocation of person power. Thousands of subpoenas were issued, hundreds of search warrants, hundreds of witness interviews, and then individual requests to foreign governments, 13 foreign governments were at least asked, and I don't know, but I think many did cooperate in the investigation. I doubt that Russia did. And when one reads the 447 final page report that has been in the hands of Congress and the American people for two months, the report again did not assert crimes that would lead to impeachment distinguishing it totally from the Nixon impeachment. There are crimes there, but also distinguish it from the Clinton impeachment. There were crimes there. And so a rehashing of the record in the House of Representatives, which is underway, although doubtless pleasing to the ears of the president's many critics, is unlikely in the extreme to change the hearts and minds of the American people. In short, my submission to the House, whatever your politics, whatever your views of President Trump, America should stay the traditional course. The presidential race, as you probably know, is already in high dudgeon. Candidates, including the president himself, flooded the state of Iowa last week. The iconic Iowa caucuses, where neighbors gathered together in living rooms and fellowship halls, are only six months away. No fewer than 23 Democrats see the opportunity of a lifetime 
to capture the White House as soon as next year and to give the boot to America's first tweeting president. And they may well be right. Early polls show that every major Democratic candidate beats President Trump hands down. Of course, it's quite early and too early to predict an election outcome 18 months from now. But the critical point is that the democratic process is vibrantly at work, which is precisely why this country has not engaged in impeachment activity for two centuries. Elections in a democratic society, elections fair and square, honest elections provide the way forward for the United States. Impeachment of a duly elected president will be a doomed exercise in utter conceit, while giving comfort and encouragement globally to the planet's implacable enemies of democracy and freedom, C, E, G, Russia, and China. And so my suggestion to the House, let the election process, already in high gear and with high spirits, go forward unimpeded by the divisive encumbrance of outmoded impeachment. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Starr, thank you very much for your talk, and thank you for being with us today and agreeing to answering our questions. Uh, you drew quite a lot of parallels between uh, Mr. Muller's report and your own report. Um, and one of the things I noticed is that they both went beyond maybe what they were in initially investigating. So you started off looking at the Whitewater Land Company and then ended up uh, looking a lot at uh, the Lewinsky affair. What are the boundaries placed upon special counsel or independent counsel um, when they are investigating these types of things and when they're investigating the President of the United States? One critical difference between the special counsel who uh, is an officer of the Justice Department, is that under the statute in which I was appointed, the so-called independent counsel was appointed by three judges. The three judges set the abbot of the jurisdiction, the authority of the independent counsel to investigate. Uh, and so each time that there was a, a, an add-on, as it were, there would be a collaborative exercise between the Attorney General of the United States and then the three-judge panel under the statute. And so each time, for example, things that have now disappeared into the uh, myths of history, uh, the engineering of the firings of the White House travel office employees by uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, we were asked to investigate. Who asked us? The Attorney General of the United States to the Special Division, then uh, to us. So to the most controversial phase, the Lewinsky phase, was authorized by the Attorney General of the United States. When we had information that the President of the United States, President Clinton, was uh, in the process of not only committing perjury himself, but also encouraging others to perjure themselves, uh, we took that information, we verified the information, and we took that information to uh, Attorney General Janet Reno, who was appointed by uh, President Clinton, she actually sent over one of the most senior prosecutors in the Justice Department, who was head of one of the sections of the criminal division of the Department of Justice. He reviewed the evidence. He actually took a lot of the evidence back to the Justice Department itself. It was reviewed there, and in very short order, Janet Reno, to her credit, appointed by President Clinton, determined that what we call the Lewinsky phase had to be investigated. She again went to the special division, three federal judges, provides them with the appropriate information, the request to expand the investigation, and there you have it. So I was then authorized by the three-judge panel to look into whether Monica Lewinsky and others, obviously including the President of the United States, committed perjury, intimidated witnesses, and so forth. So there are checks and balances. I mean, there were at the time, 
But now to come back to the Mueller report, he famously now uh, led the investigation, the indictment of Paul Manafort, uh, Rick Gates, Mr. Manafort's junior partner, and so forth. That would have been authorized by the Justice Department. So it is a misunderstanding, I think, on the part of many people, uh, e even lawyers, uh, perhaps even some judges, that for an independent counsel or now special counsel to investigate this arena, it has to be authorized. Mm -hmm. Now by the Attorney General, previously by the Attorney General and the three-judge panel. And what do you think were the main considerations of the three-judge panel and the Attorney General when they allowed you to extend the remit of your investigation? They determined, in effect, uh, whether, l l let me talk about the independent counsel statute under which I, I operated. They determined basically this. Is there reason to investigate? So is criminality afoot? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, should it be someone outside the Justice Department who does the investigation as opposed to the criminal division of the Justice Department or our United States Attorney's Office? In other words, do we go outside the department mm -hmm. or do we stay within the department? Interestingly enough, Robert Mueller III was under the new regime, which has been in effect for 20 years, is appointed by the Attorney General here, the Acting Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, but is given, and it's a public charter, here's the charter th that says, here's what you are to investigate, and what the charter of May 17, 2017, enumerates is, you are determined, Robert Mueller III, whether there was collusion by the presidential campaign with Russian interests, Russian authorities, and so forth. So that's what the Bob Mueller report was all about, and that's now the somewhat forgotten part of his report. Well over 200 pages devoted to, in the most detailed manner, to everything that was found with respect to possible collusion or the crime of conspiracy, and the evidence simply was not there. I think, by the way, if I may editorialize, uh, that this helps explain uh, President Trump's deep anger. What is this? And he kept, and, and, the, and <laughs> part two of the Mueller report goes into detail as how the president would ask almost anyone who walks in the door, say it ain't so, I did not conspire with Russia. I'm trying to reset the relationship with Russia, whether it was wise policy or not wise policy, it was a policy determination. But what we now know, again, as I said at the podium, there was no connection between Vladimir Putin, oddly enough, even with the, the Moscow Trump idea, uh, Tower idea, there was no connection that Bob Mueller was able to find mm -hmm. between Vladimir Putin and his oligarchs and the other Russian interests. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Trump Organization. So moving in a, a different direction, I wanted to talk a bit about the treatment of both you and Robert Mueller, and you mentioned that actually the Trump administration had been quite good about cooperating with him. Um, but obviously you have critics and political opponents um, that criticize both of you, and at the time we had um, uh, James Carville here on Monday, and I think he said that you were on a religious crusade uh, <laughs> <laughs> against President Bill Clinton. Do you think it's possible to operate in a way which stops that kind of criticism, and do you think it's possible to not be accused of bias when you're carrying out that kind of No. Uh, the history in our country of special counsels or independent counsel is one of controversy, enmity, and strife. The, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it, briefly, here's the executive summary. The very first special counsel appointed in the history of the United States of America was by Ulysses S. Grant after the Civil War, and within months, General Grant himself fired the special counsel for being too aggressive. The same thing happened in the Truman administration. Famously, the same thing happened in the Nixon administration. No one likes to be investigated. I was investigated by the Justice Department for alleged violations of grand jury secrecy. I was exonerated. I was acquitted, so to speak. No charges were brought. But I didn't like that a lot, and I didn't like the fact that people were urging our investigation to be investigated when we were still investigating, right? So I viewed it as a deliberate interference with our investigation, call it obstruction of justice, if you will. Uh, so I think it's inevitable. Here's the difference. 
President Clinton spoke through very able surrogates like James Carville. James Carville even wrote a book called, And the Horse He Rode In On. <laughs> and who is the bete noir of that book? Yours truly. But what James can't do, he can't quarrel with the facts. John Adams put it beautifully in defending, if I may say so, here in the mother country, the young British redcoat soldiers charged in what we call the, Ma the Boston Tea Party. Remember the Boston Massacre, those of you from the US? I'm sure you have a much more benign way of describing what happened uh, by the rebellious whatever. So to the jury, John Adams says facts are flinty things. And as he asked the jury in Boston, which acquitted several of those soldiers, one of his clients they convicted, but several were acquitted. Facts are flinty things. What James Carville cannot dispute, God bless you, James, the raging Cajun is mm -hmm. the President of the United States whom he served very ably, very forcefully in his unique way, committed crimes. Now what the apologist to this day, I was in a program last week where a met former member of Congress who voted against impeachment at the time said it certainly is true that President Clinton lied to the American people. My view is, with all due respect, Congressman, very nice man, with all due respect, Congressman, you are soft peddling what he pled guilty to or agreed to in the grand settlement and what essentially is undisputed by all reasonable people. He committed perjury and he, I'm talking about Clinton, mm -hmm. obstructed justice. James will only have great rhetorical responses to that, that Starr is a religious zealot. I happen to be religious. So do about, what shall I say, the majority of the American people. William O. Douglas put it very well in the Supreme Court opinion. We are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. But it doesn't matter what your religious view is or is not. No matter what your belief structure is, facts matter. <laughs> and that's what special counsels are called upon to do. Just find out the facts, evaluate the facts, and then let people draw their conclusions. In contrast, final point on this, President Trump was continually personally assailing Robert Mueller III. That was his choice. I urged publicly, I don't know the president, I met the president all at once. I urged the president, don't. <laughs> it's unwise. Let, I didn't follow the other, follow President Clinton's example. Rise above it publicly, be doing your job, but then have your assassins out trying to destroy the independent counsel. That's the good American way of doing it. <laughs> That's exactly, and I mean assassination, excuse me. I mean, I mean, have them, I mean destroy. I don't mean find out a few things. Of it. I mean destroy their reputations. Hire private investigators looking into their private lives. And then take them out. Look, politics and James Stewart, Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote a book about the Clinton White House and he called it blood sport. Politics is a tough sport. But if you can do it with integrity, Bill Clinton didn't do it with integrity. The American people will decide whether they think Donald Trump is doing his job with integrity or not. If they don't, who knows what will happen in 2016. My simple point today before this distinguished house is don't feed the furies of hell to put us through impeachment. <laughs> it didn't work with Clinton and he was guilty of crimes. And Dianne Feinstein knew, I'm sorry, United States Senator from California, knew that he had committed crimes, but then said, no, no, no. And she didn't say, oh, it's because it had to do with a private relationship. That's simply rhetoric. No, no, no. He was warned, President Clinton was warned before going into the federal grand jury on August 17, 1998. He was warned by the Democratic minority leader. Actually, I'm, what am I saying? Yes, he was the minority leader of the, of the House. Dick Gephardt from Missouri. Mr. President, I'm paraphrasing, let the record of the House show. 
Mr. President, we know you committed perjury in your civil deposition in the sexual harassment case. And by the way, you might say, is this about a private relationship? It's about a civil rights lawsuit brought under the civil rights laws of the United States involving allegations of sexual harassment. Perhaps they were true, perhaps they were false. Perhaps it's a matter of interpretation, but that's what the lawsuit was about. And President Clinton committed perjury and he obstructed justice. So what Dick Kebhart, the minority leader, said to the president is, Mr. President, we know you committed perjury. Don't commit perjury before the federal grand jury. And he did anyway, because President Clinton is, ex he's Oxford educated. He's extremely good with the language and he's the most empathetic human being probably on the face of the earth. People like him as a person. It's impossible as just a human being, leave politics aside, not to find Bill Clinton as a person to be eminently likable and charming and delightful and all those things. Uh, and again, he was wise. Mm -hmm. Leave it to others. Leave it to James Carville to say really naughty things about Ken Starr. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for answering my questions. We'll go out to the audience. If you have a question for Ken Starr, please raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Can we go to the blue t-shirt? Uh, yeah. Hey, um, thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering, given what you said about President Clinton and the recent Trump es episode, would you say it's fair to conclude that, at least to a certain extent, the president is above the law? Absolutely not. The president is not above the law. Uh, and if there are, in fact, crimes, uh, then there should be an accountability for that. My point has to do really with impeachment. And so let me expand on this. I think the United States uh, of America, through we the people, would do well to now have a conversation about the use of impeachment. In our history, we had the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson right after the Civil War. Some would say that was a political dispute. Here in the mother country, you likewise have had impeachments that could fairly and, fairly and reasonably be characterized as political disputes. But it cannot be doubted that the impeachment of Richard Nixon was about crimes. But what happened, of course, there was that there was a parallel investigation underway by the Senate Select Committee on Watergate. And the most important evidence against President Nixon actually emerged by virtue of the Senate Select Committee. And it was then Republicans, including the late Senator Barry Goldwater and others, who then, looking at the facts as revealed on the Nixon tapes, the White House tapes, went to the president and urged him to resign. That is the dynamic that would happen through what? Through congressional oversight, congressional inquiry. Impeachment uh, has worked well for the United States with respect to the removal of officers who otherwise can't be removed, namely federal judges who enjoy uh, service for life during good behavior in the words of the Constitution. But we have elections in the United States. You have elections here. You have parliamentary devices, such as special committees of inquiry and the like. I use the Senate Select Committee uh, on Watergate as a counterpart. Let the House Judiciary Committee or the Senate Judiciary Committee do oversight uh, work to hold the president uh, accountable. We're really talking here today about impeachment as a tool. Is it a good tool or is it not? And I think history now tells us that presidential impeachment is a very, very bad tool. Can we go to the hand in the second row in the check chat? Thank you. So for Bill Clinton, there was something underneath all of the um, like there was perjury underneath it all, and with Nixon as well. But with Trump, if there was no collusion, why do you think he acted so like suspiciously with firing <laughs> Comey and D Don McGahn and all the oh. rest? Well, the firing of James Comey, that's a, a wonderful and rich question. The short answer is I, of course, do, do not know the, the mind of the president, so I'll have to offer you uh, an opinion from the sidelines. 
my opinion from the sidelines, but it I think comes out during especially book two of the Mueller report, is that he knew he was innocent of the charge of collusion. He could not understand why this investigation began to begin with. We can talk about, well, how did it begin and why did it begin? Well, I think we're going to learn more uh, as to why the investigation actually began, and I'm not talking about the Mueller investigation, but the investigation that he inherited. So that's going to be stay tuned. We're waiting for an inspector general report. We've been waiting now and expecting it for some many days of Michael Horowitz, who is a career civil servant, who was confirmed by the United States Senate. So that's our check and balance. So he's accountable, but he enjoys independence of his office. And his report on, among other things, the origins of the investigation, well, I think will be helpful. I'm going to boldly predict that the investigations, including those by John Durham, a universally respected United States attorney who has grand jury power, he can bring people before the grand jury. That's a very helpful tool. Will, in the fullness of time, reveal why it is, but we know from book one, I'm calling book one the first part of the Mueller report, the president was guiltless with respect to conspiring with the Russians. So I think anger, he wanted uh, Jim Comey specifically to make a public statement, this is all in the Mueller report, that you're not under investigation. Jim Comey, for whatever reason, Jim Comey probably has been here, can say, here's why I didn't tell the public what I told the president privately three different times. You are not under investigation. And he wasn't. So I will also say this, uh, James Comey once upon a, a time was persona non grata to the Democrats because of his high-handed behavior during the presidential campaign itself with respect to his announcements was, uh, concerning the Hillary Rodham Clinton, the Secretary of State, that investigation. He holds a press conference saying exoneration, et cetera, and that was improper, absolutely improper. It was ultra-virus, as we say in the law. Then two weeks before the election, he then announces, I'm reopening the investigation. Now, I remember this vividly in November 2016, that many people who supported President Clinton, I'm sorry, Hillary, she did not become President Clinton, mm -hmm. Secretary of State Clinton, laid the blame for the defeat of Hillary Rodham Clinton, expected to win, at the feet of James Comey, because twice he acted in a way that he should not have acted in terms of what I view as abuse of, uh, abuse of power. So I can imagine the fury of the president, <laughs> who really was guiltless with respect to conspiring with the Russians, and Jim Comey would not issue a, a public statement. And Mueller kind of holds that against him, uh, because he does view, and I profoundly disagree with this, Bob Mueller identifies the firing of James Comey as the first obstructive act. I think, with all due respect, Mr. Mueller, who I respect, got it badly wrong, not as a matter of fact, but as a fundamental issue of our separation of powers. The Tories are going through a very interesting process right now, right, to determine who's the next. We don't do it that way, <laughs> right? And we also really have elections here. We don't have elections, right, called by the prime minister, and so as Mrs. May uh, did, whether she was wise or not, others can say, in calling the election. We know when our, when our elections are. My fundamental point today is bring all these issues, however you feel about the president, about the firing of James Comey, into the election process. Debate it in the traditions of this great society and then, and then vote. But tell your congressperson or your American friends to tell their congressperson, don't take the nation through this. We were dragged through it with, with Clinton, and we could predict from the outset that impeachment was not going to be successful. Don't do it unless you have this bipartisan, essentially, consensus that emerged during the Nixon years. And, and you say, well, we don't know the facts. Yes, we do. We've had the Bob Mueller investigation read the report, and I think most fair-minded people would come to the view, as apparently the, ha the majority of House Democrats currently believe no impeachment. 
<laughs> That's not what you see on the networks or on cable news. You hear all the calls, well, we gotta have more witnesses and so forth. But quietly, the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives, at least for now, agrees with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, no impeachment. As we say to our children, what is it that you don't understand about the word no? <laughs> Can we go to the member in the pink shirt? Thank you very much for being here. Um, my question is, given that you uh, talked about the language in the Constitution regarding um, impeachment and bribery, what are your thoughts on the lawsuit pushed by former White House counsels Norm Eisen and Richard Painter regarding um, Trump not divesting from his businesses and therefore possibly violating the Emoluments Clause? Yeah, I th I've always found the Emoluments Clause to be quite uh, intriguing, uh, but I think the American people, uh, as a political matter, answered that because one of the political issues during the campaign is are you going to divest yourself of your business interests by placing your assets into a family trust or whatever? Uh, and President Trump said, no, I'm not going to do that. And the American people, 61, almost 62 million people voted in favor of him notwithstanding that. The emoluments clause in the Constitution seems to be more naturally to read such as if someone, not in bribery, but if someone is coming to you as the chief executive of the United States with this very, very generous gift, only because you're the president of the United States, right? You're not lifelong friends or whatever. You turn that gift over, which is what presidents do. Each presidential library and museum will have this absolute cornucopia of gifts, some of them immensely, val they don't sell them, at least to my knowledge they don't sell them. That to me is what the Emoluments Clause was meant to do, to affect someone's judgment, uh, to provide a gift or the like. But I realize that there are people, uh, Professor Tribe of Harvard, uh, former Ambassador Eisen, uh, very respected people have a different view, but it has not been authoritatively resolved by the Supreme Court. It's a little murky. You can go to the hand in the second row in the black t-shirt, third row. Hi, uh, so you brought up the Nixon impeachment quite a right. bit uh, and the congressional inquiries that were instrumental in Nixon's removal from office. Uh, the Trump administration has proved, I won't say obstructive, but unwilling <laughs> to uh, allow various former staffers to testify before Congress um, and unwilling to hand over a number right. of documents, which would impede the same type of right. fi public finding of fact that we saw in uh, Nixon's impeachment. So I was wondering how we re should respond to that, given how instrumental that was in kind of the last successful removal. Right, and I would say that... Uh, uh, Congress has its power. Article one uh, vests the Congress of the United States with a wide-ranging group of powers, and by history and tradition, that includes uh, supervisory powers and investigation powers. And those have been uh, very generously interpreted by the courts. Uh, and so I think you're seeing the play unfold. We have had no definitive resolution, including even by the executive branch. For example, we saw that a squabble uh, between the House Judiciary Committee and uh, the Attorney General of the United States, who I have great confidence in, uh, William Barr, with whom I served under President Bush 41. Uh, I know him to be a person of integrity. You can disagree with the judgment, but he calls them the way he sees them. They worked it out uh, two weeks ago, they being the House Judiciary Committee and the Justice Department. So we'll sort of see what happens. Uh, the Congress has contempt power, and it's using that power, right? It is now holding officers of the executive branch in contempt. That's not self-executing. It then goes in our separation of powers system. We have a very, as you know in the United States, robust federal judiciary that enjoys life tenure. And so we will see all this unfold. So stay tuned. But it's a fair political point to say, I want to know what the level of cooperation is with a duly authorized branch of government and what the level of cooperation is not. I think what we're seeing is essentially war, right? 
war between the House of Representatives and the executive branch. Part of it, I think, occasioned by the fact that President Trump, I'm speculating, but I think it's fair to say, he believes the Mueller investigation was so comprehensive and so thorough, it's over. I'm not doing anything further to collaborate or to cooperate with further investigations. And that becomes then a political dispute. Can we go to the hand? Yeah, towards the back in the jacket. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, You're welcome. In a recent essay in-, in Oh, could you speak? I'm sorry, uh, in a recent the... essay in Vanity Fair, Ms. Lewinsky described what I believe is the one time that she interacted with you following the 1990s episodes. And she relayed sort of her emotional response or intellectual response, I think, sort of extraordinarily powerfully and articulately. And I've always wondered, how you felt when you encountered her on what I think was that Washington DC street corner for the first time in 15 years. It actually was at a restaurant in uh, Greenwich Village in the West Village. Uh, and uh, Alice and I were with our family on Christmas Eve. And we had the early sitting at the wonderful restaurant in the West Village. Uh, and we were on our way out to go to Lessons and Carols. There he goes, the religious zealot <laughs> goes to Lessons and Carols, can you imagine such a thing? I'll bet James Carville goes as well. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, and so I see this young lady who bears a remarkable resemblance to Monica Lewinsky, and then we sort of recognize one another. And so I feel the right thing is just to go over and inquire how are you and so forth. And in the Vanity Fair uh, article, she described me as avuncular and creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a two minute or so interaction. I was eager again to get all the family into Ubers, Lyfts, and cabs to get over. We had the three generations of the family present. Uh, and uh, I, I would, I've described it uh, as brief and poignant. Uh, because her life was so profoundly affected by what happened. But that was our only interaction. It was quite, quite brief, quite, uh, quite limited. I try to be avuncular. <laughs> In fact, at Baylor, I was commonly known as Uncle Ken. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> we have the hand in the front row in the black dress. Well, thank you very much for coming. I was wondering, the Mueller report famously says that Mr. Trump was not exonerated of crimes. You keep saying that you think that he is without guilt. Obviously, you're not in the mind of Robert Mueller. Why would you think that he would put it in writing that he's not exonerating him of crimes. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, please go ahead and finish yeah. your question. No, no, so that, that's the question. Why, why right. do you think he specifically says, I'm not exonerating him, he's not absolved of all crimes, right. but I, ha I don't have enough information, essentially. That, that was um, the, what I sorry. thought. Sorry. The yeah. exoneration comment uh, went entirely to the uh, issue of obstruction. Okay. When you read uh, part one, which is, what this investigation was all about, which was collusion. He found, no. he didn't say, I have not exonerated him. He just said, no, uh, not, not sufficient evidence, not specific evidence. But when you read the report, and I tried to give uh, this learned house a feel for the report, you have other things to do than read 447 pages. I guess I don't have enough to do because I've read it. And here it is, the, the uh, book one with respect, I call it book one because part one or book one, book two, part two, just cries out at every turn. There was no collusion, absolutely none. That's why I spoke so fervently about no collusion uh, with great confidence. And that's why the American people, it seems to me, should be very concerned. I then went on to obstruction of justice and what Bob Mueller uh, concluded is, I, I'm not charging him, but I'm not exonerating him. Well, I criticize Mr. Mueller for making such a statement. That's not the job of the prosecutor. 
The job of the prosecutor is to charge or not to charge. You see, that was the crime, so to speak, the offense that James Comey committed with respect to Hillary Rodham Clinton. He found her conduct, and he used extremely strong language to condemn her conduct as Secretary of State in connection with the server and the handling of classified information. But he said, but I'm not going to charge because of the intent element. Okay, the intent element. Did she intend and so forth to, to, to violate the espionage law when she had all that classified information on servers that we know were hackable? You just don't do that. That's not a wise thing to do, and it's a potentially criminal thing to do. But he nonetheless said at a press conference, we're not going to charge her, but her conduct, I wish I had it committed to memory was, and he condemned her conduct, that was not his job as a prosecutor. So too, it's not Bob Mueller's job as a prosecutor to exonerate anyone. His job as a prosecutor, and you say, well, that's just your view. No, I'm now relying on the regulations and the literal language of the regulations under which he was appointed, which he is to provide a confidential report to the Attorney General describing the prosecution decision and the declination decisions that he made. He did that beginning at page 175 of book one. For the next 50 pages approximately, Bob Mueller did what he was supposed to do under the regulations. Everything else was beyond, I believe, his authority, including all of book two, the so-called obstructive acts. He also clarified in the joint statement with the Justice Department, when people were confused, <laughs> this is very recently, that he did not conclude that the President of the United States had committed obstruction of justice. Thank you, that was your job. Did he commit a crime or did he not? Now, as you know, during my remarks, what I tried to show is, even if Bob Mueller had said he should be charged with obstruction of justice, but he's the President of the United States, Still in all, the Clinton impeachment tells us don't impeach for that. You need only to impeach a president of the United States if he's guilty of treason, <laughs> bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors left undefined, and that is a constitutional lacuna. There's no question. But what those two opening words means that it is such a serious abuse of trust that there must be essentially the kind of consensus that developed during the Nixon administration you willingly and knowingly entered into a conspiracy to obstruct justice, and now we know that's not enough. It was enough to remove Richard Nixon, but it was not enough to move, remove Bill Clinton. Now, what does that teach us? It teaches us the American people do not like impeachment. Wait until the next election. It's coming right around. And just to follow up on that, do you think then that we should change the boundaries? Do you think it should be a lower boundary in the Senate to impeach a president? Or do you think that actually those high boundaries are good because they mean effectively that they'll only be impeached if they meet one of those things you were talking about, treason? The, the latter, Genevieve. I think that with respect to the President of the United States, who stands uniquely in the American constitutional uh, framework, and given his importance as Professor Akil Amar of the Yale Law School, we have a future Yale Law student here, perhaps more than one, puts it, the President of the United States is uniquely on duty 24-7, every single day. Even if the President is out playing golf, President Clinton was fond of playing golf, President Obama was fond of play, playing golf, President Trump on some golf courses, and he's immoderately fond of playing golf. Even if he is on the golf course, guess what? There are people with him, and he's going to know like that if something happened. If Iran shoots down a drone, the President of the United States will know. He will be awakened at night, etc. The President is unique, and I think that impeachment is essentially with respect to the President of the United States and other executive branch officers archaic. We need the impeachment clause mechanism. So here is my fundamental submission to the House. I hope you'll vote in favor of it. Limit impeachment as a process to those officers of the United States, namely judicial officers, for whom there's no other check and no other balance. 
Congress has many checks and balance powers. There are powers called the press. The press can blow the whistle, as it frequently does, and say, here is wrongdoing, investigative reporting, which is a wonderful thing in a democracy, in a representative democracy. And even with respect to judges, investigative reporters might be saying something, but how do you get rid of a corrupt judge if he or she, heaven forbid, refuses to resign? One of the last impeachments brought against a United States judge was brought against him when he was sitting in a federal prison for having been convicted of federal crimes, of corruption, but he would not resign. What do you do under those circumstances? He was getting his paycheck in the federal prison system. Congress rightly said, this isn't right. <laughs> and so they brought articles of impeachment, and he was convicted. Uh, and a great constitutional case emerged out of that as to whether the Senate could delegate fact-finding authority to a committee, a bipartisan 10-person committee of the United States Senate. Uh, my point is, Let's get rid, so I'm gonna go ahead and say it, let's get rid of impeachment with respect to the executive branch. Congress and the American people have other ways of dealing with corrupt or abusive officials. Thank you. Can we go to the hand at the back in the blue jacket? Thanks for your talk. Um, in renouncing the necessity of the practice of impeachment, you turn to democracy in the process of election as a method for reflecting the will of the people and for potentially attaining the same ends as impeachment that is ousting Trump in the next election cycle. However, given the problems of gerrymandering, voter suppression, and the structure mm. of the electoral college system, do you really feel like we can rely on the election process to accurately mirror the will of the people? Yeah, I mean, these are fair questions because there's no, there's no issue that gerrymandering, which is configuring, drawing legislative boundaries so as to favor one's favorite party if you're a state legislature, uh, and obviously it's a hallowed tradition here in the mother country. We learned how to gerrymander from uh, the mother country. And, and we're pretty good at gerrymandering, and indeed so is every representative democracy. And so it's a fair point. Gerrymandering uh, is a, a reality of the political process. However, you can't gerrymander the United States Senate. If United States Senators, I'll use one example. If United States Senator Lindsey Graham, this is a big if, comes out in favor of the resignation of the President of the United States, that will create a firestorm. If we have some replay of what happened during the Nixon years, and I heard one of the House impeachment uh, uh, Judiciary Committee members from the Nixon House of Representatives, who was one of President Nixon's most effective defenders on the House Judiciary Committee, he flipped when he saw the evidence as it was emerging thanks to the Senate Select Committee this House member named Charles Wiggins from California flipped and he said, the president is guilty of entering into a conspiracy to obstruct justice. In that time, in the 1970s, in 1974, that was viewed as a removable offense. I'm gonna vote for impeachment. Senators for their part, from the president's party, go to him and said, you are guilty of a conspira conspiracy to obstruct justice. We're gonna to vote to remove you, you need to leave. The Clinton impeachment changed all that. We don't care enough about rule of law. So ultimately, don't forget it's the United States Senate which has the ultimate juridical authority to remove someone. So even if the House of Representatives has been badly gerrymandered, you still have the check of the United States Senate. And you have the power, let's don't forget the power of the press. We haven't talked about the reporting during Watergate, right? How did some of the other issues come to light? Because of investigative reporting. And so we should applaud investigative reporting because when facts come out, then, no matter how gerrymandered the district will be, a member of Congress, he or she, is not going to, most of them, 
will not fight reality. They will just not fight reality. Why? Because they'll say, I give up. The pres you know, President Nixon said famously, I am not a crook. Well, he wasn't a crook in the traditional sense. He was not corrupt, but he was a criminal. And the, pre and the people of the United States in the 1970s did not want a criminal in the White House. The people of the United States during the Clinton years accepted the proposition that we have a criminal in the White House. Let him serve out his term and let him be prosecuted as soon as he steps out of the White House. I think we have time for one more question. Can we go to the hand? Yeah, in the gray t-shirt, the glasses. Yeah, just over there. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. You're um, very welcome. <laughs> putting aside the question of the virtues of impeachment, as a matter of law and criminal offences, one of the reasons you gave for why there wasn't obstruction of justice, according to book two, was that uh, Trump didn't fire Mueller. But we do know that according to book two, Mueller, Trump instructed McGahn to fire Mueller and McGahn basically refused. But for the good grace, but for the good sense of Don McGahn, in a hypothetical where Trump does fire Mueller, do you think that would constitute obstruction of justice? No, uh, and we might disagree on this, but uh, when Ulysses S. Grant fired special counsel John Henderson, he was not accused of obstruction of justice. When Harry Truman's Attorney General fired the special counsel during the Truman administration, the Attorney General was not accused of obstruction of justice. When Richard Nixon personally ordered the firing of Archibald Cox, that was not one of the counts of obstruction of justice. Now why is that? Because the President of the United States has the authority to fire anyone in the executive branch for any reason that he wants to other than a corrupt reason. Self-interest is not, standing alone, a corrupt reason. So the law is entirely, if I may say so, on my side. I'm a little surprised that the president didn't follow through, but he didn't, and it, that tells us something, doesn't it? Uh, presidents will fulminate, get rid of that person, who will rid me of this quarrelsome priest? But unless, as it were, the president then follows up and fires, but I'm now assuming that he fired. He had the authority to fire Bob Mueller himself. Now had he then said, and there will be no further investigation whatsoever, that might open the door to the possibility, even though he's exercising his executive power as the President of the United States, that might open the door not to the criminal charge in my judgment of obstruction of justice unless he was bribed, but it would perhaps open the door that standing alone to impeachment. You stopped an investigation, we're going to open the investigation because we want to know was there in fact collusion. But the good news is we know that there wasn't. Just to follow up, looking at President Trump's legal authority, that's the sort of where you made the argument from. Morally, do you think it's wrong for a president to fire someone that's investigating that? Well, it depends do you on think the it's bad practice. Well, it depends on the circumstances. So let me look to history. Uh, it's difficult to answer a question in the abstract. But why did Grant uh, fire John Henderson, who had been a United States senator of the other party? It was because he was using overly aggressive tactics as General Grant saw it. And General Grant knew something about aggressive tactics. Uh, why did Harry Truman, Attorney General, fire the special counsel who he, the Attorney General, had appointed? Because Harry Truman's Attorney General, who was an honorable man, felt that the special counsel was overly aggressive in his tactics. Why did Richard Nixon fire Arch or order the firing of Archibald Cox? Because Archibald Cox rejected a perfectly plausible, if not reasonable, alternative to just turning over the tapes entirely. Who knows what's being talked about on the tape? What about family matters? Vulgar language, we now knew that Richard Nixon used highly vulgar language and that would not have sat well, at least at the time, with the American people. So the president was concerned about that and his proposed compromise was that a United States Senator from the other party, a very recognized, respected Senator, would review the transcripts, they would be authenticated by the FBI, so this is an accurate transcript, and then he would 
excise out matters relating to privacy or irrelevant matter. Archibald Cox rejected that. I want the full tapes and nothing but the unexpurgated, unedited version of the tapes. And Charles Allen Wright, who is one of the great academics of our time, a half century ago, the, as in Wright and Miller for you future lawyers, this towering figure in the American Legal Academy was one of President Nixon's legal defenders whose position was, this is an outrageous and ridiculously unreasonable position on the part of special prosecutor Archibald Cox. Now why would Bob Mueller have been fired by, uh, by President Trump? One reason is, I was totally innocent and this is hurting, and you see this, in, you see this over and over again in the Mueller report. This is hurting my ability to, to establish a relationship with Russia. Is that a good idea or a bad idea that's a policy squabble? And it's just affecting my ability generally because that's all the press cares about is a conspiracy with Russia which didn't happen. And now we know the irony is it didn't happen. Richard Nixon's thugs broke into the Watergate and committed petty crimes. The Trump campaign did not. So I can understand the anger of the President of the United States who says, at least FBI director, tell the pe American people what you told me, which is you're not under investigation. If somebody did something wrong, and that's also part of the Mueller report. The President told Jim Comey early on, if somebody did something wrong, go get him. He wanted to go soft on, on General Flynn. We've exceeded our time. Let, let me just close with this. The General Flynn, Mike Flynn, National Security Advisor, is a living tragedy because he lied, apparently, on more than one occasion about doing his duty as the National Security Advisor designate on December 29 of 2016 when he, having been instructed to do so not by the President-elect of the United States, but by transition figures of great authority at the elbow of the president-elect of the United States, reach out to Ambassador Sergei Kislyak of Russia to the United States and urge him not to do that which is about to happen, which is to impose their version of sanctions on the United States and its businesses, because the Obama administration on December 29 imposed sanctions on Russia. Why? For interference the 2016 presidential election, which the Obama administration had known about for months. Only on December 29, 22 days left in the Obama presidency, were sanctions imposed. Why would they have been imposed 22 days before the new president takes office? When the new president is saying, essentially, I want to have a reset with Russia. Well, I don't know, that's way above my pay grade, but what I do know is this, Mike Flynn, who I've never met, I've never talked to, but who recently fired his lawyers after entering a guilty plea, <laughs> according to the Mueller report, was only talking to Sergei Kislyak about please don't impose sanctions, don't up the ante on us. And Mike Flynn was persuasive because Putin stood down as a gesture to the incoming president-elect. Now, why would, pres why would Mike Flynn have lied about that? It's one of the unanswered tragedies, I think, of the investigation. Was it because he felt he was violating the Logan Act, which means that a private citizen should not be, and that's a smart statute, should not be negotiating on behalf of the United States, so to speak? with a foreign government? I don't know, but that's one of yet to be answered questions. Well, thank you very much for answering our questions. Can everyone join me in thanking Ken Starr for being here today?